The knowledge of MS and advancements in treatment have been significant over the past few decades. Conversations between patients and healthcare clinicians differ significantly nowadays from those in the past. Dr. Howard Weiner talks about the past, present, and future of MS and provides a message of hope for those living with the disease. My name is Dr. Howard Weiner. I'm a neurologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and at the Harvard Medical School. I've really spent my whole life uh, working on multiple sclerosis, and it's an exciting time for me to talk to you, uh, tell you where we've come with MS, and I think that we've made a great deal of progress, and there's a great deal of hope. I, can, I was at the MS uh, center yesterday, and I saw patients. Uh, I saw some patients who I've followed for five or 10 years that are doing great. I saw a young man who's a medical student who just came down with MS. His mother's a doctor, and he said to me, well, Dr. Weiner, is there anything that can help me? Uh, can you treat my MS? Will I be able to become a doctor? And it was with a great deal of satisfaction uh, that I said to him, don't worry, we have treatments for you. We'll need to follow you, but you should be able to become a doctor, raise your family, and live a normal life. Uh, so this is very exciting. And nobody likes to get an illness, and when I see people and they're sick, they say, why did this happen to me? We know there's illness in the world. We have all these hospitals, we have kids who get sick, so they, we don't have a world where there's no illness, and there's no family that doesn't have somebody that gets an illness, but what is a doctor what we like to have is when someone comes and has an illness, we can treat them, we can help them, and that's what we're working for. When I first started working in MS, I would sit with somebody and I would tell them they have multiple sclerosis, and they'd say, well, doctor, what's the treatment? And I would have to say, well, we don't have a treatment, but I know in the future we will have a treatment. And that actually uh, has happened. Now, the big uh, question, the big question is, how do you get a treatment? And how can you treat a disease like MS? Well, in order to have a treatment, you need to understand the cause. And I think that one of the uh, major advances that we've had in MS is that we now know a lot about what causes MS. Uh, and then, so the question is, well, what does cause it? And how do the treatments work? Uh, the way I explain it to my patients is if you think about kidney transplant, if, if uh, I get a kidney transplant, say, from my wife, uh, my body would try and reject that kidney because they see it as foreign. And that's what happens in MS. The immune system, which would reject a kidney, uh, sees the brain as foreign and thinks the brain is abnormal, that it's a foreign body that needs to be rejected and the immune system attacks it. And that's why MS is called an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune, the immune system is attacking the brain. Now, why in the world would our own immune system attack the brain? Actually, there's other autoimmune diseases, uh, type one diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, so there's a whole class of diseases that are autoimmune. And we don't know exactly why, but we think it might relate to uh, uh, the immune system be exposed to viruses or other bacteria. And there's something on the virus or bacteria that the immune system goes to fight, but that same structure is also in the brain. And so the immune system goes to fight that off, but then it goes to the brain and it sees that uh, there's something like the virus in the brain and it attacks the brain. So it's a case of mistaken identity or something we called molecular mimicry. There's other examples of this in medicine. Um, for example, when you get a strep throat, why is it bad to get a strep throat? Well, uh, one of the structures on the streptococcus, the bacteria, is also on the heart, so you can get rheumatic fever after that. Initially, people wondered whether MS was caused by a virus that infected the body or the immune system. And we now know that it's caused by the immune system. A virus may trigger it, but it's not 
there's no MS virus. It used to be that MS patients couldn't give blood in the blood bank in case they were infected, but now MS patients can give blood in the blood bank. One of the first experiments we did here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston, in the 80s, we treated MS patients with a something that suppresses the immune system, a form of chemotherapy, something called cyclophosphamide, and we found that it shut down all of the uh, shut down the attacks the patient had. And that was one of the first clues that I had and that we had that MS was related to the immune system. The first drugs that were then approved for MS came in the 90s, uh, injectable drugs that shut down the uh, overactive immune system so that you could think about having a, a bad cell that attacks the brain and a good cell that regulates, and that the bad cells, there's too many of those. And the drugs that we've gotten for MS uh, decrease the, the bad cells, if you will, the killer cells, and induce regulatory cells. So in the 90s, we had our first injectable drugs, and this decreased the number of relapses that we, the MS patient had. And one of the breakthroughs in order to approve the drugs was the MRI scan. Uh, MRI imaging allowed us to look at the brain. Imagine trying to treat tuberculosis without a chest x-ray. Uh, I remember when I was at one of the first FDA panels where they approved a drug for MS, the doctors on the panel said, well, how do we know they wouldn't have done better anyway? And you could look at the MRI scan and there were less spots and less things uh, going on in the brain. So the first FDA-approved drugs were injectable drugs, and we saw the change on the MRI. As time went on, there were other drugs that uh, we were able to uh, use to treat MS. One was a drug uh, that blocked the entry of uh, cells into the brain. The MS drugs initially were the interferon drugs and a drug called Copaxone. The interferon drugs, Avonex, Rebif, Betasura, and these were the interferon drugs. Then came a drug called Tysabri, which blocked cells from going into the brain and directly showed that if you block cells from going into the brain, people don't have attacks. And the Tysabri was very effective, although there was a side effect. Uh, because the cells were needed to fight off infection, some people got a a brain disease called PML, so we had to be very careful about using that drug. When I then sat with patients after all these injections, they said, well, one day, will you ever have pills? I hate taking these injections. And in the last uh, decade, we now have pills to treat MS. These pills uh, also affect the immune system. They shut down their activity. They uh, trap them so they don't go into the brain. And now we have pills that we can give to MS patients. Um, as we get more and more treatments, they become more effective. And uh, more recently, we've had uh, infusions that we can give, a drug that attacks the B cell, a drug called Ocrevus, which was approved. And this, uh, uh, the T cell that goes in the brain needs a B cell, and uh, this was very effective. So we're getting more and more effective drugs to treat our patients, and this is why I could tell the medical student, don't worry, we have drugs to shut down your illness. Now, this happened to be a man. If it was a woman who's a medical student, I could also tell her, don't worry, you can have babies, uh, even though you have MS. Uh, actually, when a woman is pregnant, MS does better. And uh, we have many, many of our patients who've had children uh, while they've had their MS and raising uh, their families. We just did a, um, uh, I was just reviewing a paper and I was at the uh, MS meeting in Paris called the Ectrams meeting. And there were thousands of doctors there, uh, maybe 10,000 uh, interested in MS. I remember when I used to go to meetings, there was a few hundred. And we began to see data that if you decrease attacks by using these drugs, people don't get as much disability. One of the major challenges of MS is a form called progressive MS. Uh, MS goes through different stages. The initial stage is the relapsing stage when people have attacks and recover. 
And if that isn't treated later on, the disease can become progressive. And what happens when the disease become progressive is that inflammation gets set up in the brain and it slowly gets worse and worse. And we don't have good treatments for progressive MS. Uh, and that's one of our main challenges. Uh, actually, the, there are new drugs coming out. There's some drugs that have shown some efficacy in progressive MS, and we hope that there's more. So if there's a challenge that we have is how do we treat progressive MS? But one, good, uh, one of the good news is that MS, uh, there are less and less progressive patients with MS. I talked to one of my patients in the center yesterday, and she said, you know, when I came with my, uh, uh, early on, I saw more people sitting in wheelchairs in your clinic, and now there's less and less of those patients. Now, one of the, uh, I wrote a book uh, about MS and my experience. I called it Curing MS. Uh, and uh, what did I mean? Every When people come to see me, they say, well, doc, when's there going to be a cure? And what I did is I said, well, what do you mean by cure? Because if you want to cure a disease, you have to define it. And I think that there are three cures. Uh, the first cure is to someone gets the disease and you stop it from progressing. And I think we're now curing people, that we have people who have attacks, who uh, are getting disability, but we have drugs to shut down those attacks so that we stop the disease in its tracks. So I think that in a way, there's a certain number of people that we are curing at this time. Now, another thing that I use is a boxer analogy that if you have MS, you're like a boxer in the ring and MS is trying to hit you. And that the drugs that we um, use stop you from getting hit by the boxer so that you, ne you, don't, you don't get hit at all. So one of my patients says, well, can you get me out of the ring so the boxer isn't there? So we, we can't do that yet, but I'll tell you how we might be able to do that. So the first cure is stopping attacks and making a person to be uh, normal. And I think we're doing that now. The second cure that people talk about is rebuilding damaged myelin or the damaged part of the nervous system. Now, this is harder. And we, however, are making progress in this. Uh, there are certain drugs that are being tested that might remyelinate or uh, repair the axon that's been damaged. And there's a major uh, series of research studies that we're doing. And just as I said to patients, uh, I'm sure one day there'll be pills. I'm sure one day that we'll be able to shut down attacks. I know that one day via stem cells or other types of research, we'll be able to rebuild the nervous system. I don't think this is going to happen in a year or two, but it's going to happen. And that would be the second cure, is to help um, uh, rebuild part of the nervous system. Now, the third cure is maybe the biggest cure. We, we talk about curing polio. So how did we cure polio? We didn't really cure polio. We prevented it. We found a vaccine. And I think we're now understanding MS enough that one day we may be able to do something so that no one gets MS. Now, how is that possible? Well, we think that the environment can... Uh, triggered the disease. And one of the areas we and other people are studying is something called the gut microbiome. And there's a lot of um, bacteria. There's trillions of bacteria in our gut. And there's some evidence that that may actually be involved in the disease or trigger the disease. And we and other people now are trying to understand the gut and environmental factors. And once we can understand that better, we may be able to manipulate it so that uh, no one gets the disease. So I um, I don't know whether I'll be around for the time when the uh, MS is cured, but I know I'm going to be looking down and kids will be getting a vaccine and nobody will get MS. Uh, right now, we need to learn to treat the people that we have. So if you're a patient with MS, what should you do? What is the hope for you now? Well, uh, you should uh, be on one of the MS medicines. Uh, you need to be followed carefully. We follow our patients with MRI to make sure that the MRI 
is stable. It may be that after a while you won't have to be on MS medicines, but we need to keep the MS medicines going. We give people vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important, so everybody should be taking uh, vitamin D, which helps the immune system. Uh, don't smoke. Smoking is very bad, so you don't want to smoke if you have MS. People ask about diet and probiotics. Uh, we don't know exactly which diet. A Mediterranean diet might be better. Uh, you can drink some alcohol socially. That isn't a problem. Exercise is good. Uh, a positive attitude is good. Uh, physical therapy can be helpful. Uh, think of yourself as what you want to do in your life and what you want to experience, not that I necessarily have a disease, uh, so that uh, a man that I saw yesterday said, you know, Dr. Weiner, I don't even think about my MS only when you're here. So as a physician, I feel very gratified that when I started working on MS decades ago, I would sit with somebody and say, well, we don't have a treatment, but uh, I know we will. Now I sit with patients, and all the doctors that sit with MS patients say, you know, we have treatments for you, research is going on, and we're going to one day have all three of the MS cures. So uh, it's satisfying for me as a doctor and anybody who has MS or their family has MS, they should take hope that we're making great progress. Thank you very much.